I do. Well, on there, and then I have my phone logged in. So I have at least two people. So, so again, like everything else in the disclaimer wise, uh, the, well, this is a, an old slide, so I've got to change that. Um, anyways, just aspect of you guys are all part of extensions of us. Um, and then more importantly, like everything else, you're potentially saving my life. <coughs> yeah, that was last last year. Um, endocrine, basically, endo means from within, crinin uh, means to separate, logo is the study. So we're looking at the study to separate from within. Uh, if you break down what endocrinology is and all that stuff. Uh, this is one of the multi-system systems. Um, you have multiple, if you go back to biology and all that stuff, you remember everything from um, the pineal to pituitary to the thyroid. Um, we have our thymus, which most adults no longer have a thymus. Um, that's usually permanent, uh, prominent only in the kids. Um, so it doesn't really affect us, you know, from that aspect. Uh, the adrenal glands, the pancreas, of course, is the big one that most people think about. Um, and then from there, the ovaries for the girls and testes for the boys. We're going to kind of sort of talk about here uh, um, the uh, hyperthyroid um, stuff, uh, which is a number of different uh, pieces, um, a little bit of the adrenal stuff, um, and then the ending it with the uh, DKA uh, or the all the sugar stuff from the pancreas. So really only going to touch upon three major um, endocrine hormones or endocrine and all that stuff. So most of when we're looking at um, endocrine problems, okay, do you guys actually make the diagnosis? No. Okay. What's the one where that you guys could pretty much, you know, you know without a fact on an endocrine problem, what diagnosis can you make? What system? What organ? That's why kidneys not part of the, of the out of these things. The pancreas stuff, okay. So without a doubt, you guys can diagnose a pancreatic problem, okay. Um, so for those problems, um, and of course we'll get to that. Most of the time, everything we do is supportive, um, so it's not like we're really doing anything significant in the pre-hospital. Uh, but there are some of the cases, knowing the information, of course, is half the battle um, and getting stuff to the ED doctor. Um, and then there's an old adage, um, the mind doesn't know, the eyes can't see, the, the ears can't hear, the nose can't smell, and the fingers and hands can't touch. Okay, So if you don't know about it, then you're not thinking about it. Um, and it's always the weird cases are the ones to know and to be thinking about. So pan panhypopituitarism. Say that again. Say that yeah, again. exactly. <laughs> Going back um, again, high school biology, the pituitary gland is the master gland. So everything is affected by the pituitary. Okay. If you're looking at things um, over here, like the ACTH, um, the thyroid stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, for, or the follicle stimulating hormone for the sex stuff, um, and then ADH, which is the anti-diuretic hormone. This is the one that predominantly, if you're drinking beer and all that stuff, that kind of sort of affects, that's why you pee a lot. Um, we're getting into that later. So it does, the pituitary does have a lot of roles um, for things. Uh, so inadequate production can, of course, affect things, and the clinical presentation can vary. Um, when we talk about cortisol stuff or thyroid stuff, um, of course, if you don't have your sex steroids in as an early age in life, um, that's why you get your dwarfisms or your acromegaly or the giantism um, if they get too much sex steroids and all that stuff. So where the growth comes into play. Let me want to know. You gotta just make this so interesting. All right, so word finds, so things that you're gonna be looking at and all. 
this is really this is really what the endocrine system is like okay if you could take and go through right the dead center of course the glands the pituitary pancreas sex glands the adrenals the parathyroids the thyroids and then it just blows up from there okay this will be test and quiz later yeah, yeah exactly the bubbles I mean, it's even, I mean, everything from the simple fact of like down here and controlling blood pressure, um, having fat break down our immune systems. I mean, the, the endocrine system plays such a vital role in everything that we do. So if you really think about it, the nervous system is the, the highway system of our control, and then the endocrine is the waterways. So just so it's a slower way of getting around, but it can get it does get there. It has some transportation needs. So the thyroid, we basically have TA, uh, TRH coming from the hypothalamus going down to the anterior pituitary, which does TSH, um, which releases T3 and T4. Um, T4 is the major one, uh, and then from there they're predominantly bound to protein in the bloodstream. Okay, um, and then ultimately T4 is broken down or, or deionated to the more active form of T3. So people that have thyroid problems and they're really anxious, they have a lot of circulating T3. Um, and the other thing to get into when we talk about um, what's the one concern for nuclear radiation and all that stuff. What salt do we give to people that have been potentially if there's a nuclear disaster? Iodine, yep, yeah. We have iodine for potential nuclear stuff, and it's purely it's the whole purpose of it is to block. Um, it's to help with the protection of the thyroid gland. So hyperthyroidism um, can occur for any age. Um, usually less than 15 is rare. Um, females, of course, more prevalent than males for this. Uh, Graves disease is the, num is the number one cause, and that's an immunologic problem. Um, and then you can have other things, so thyroiditis, pituitary, um, tumors, uh, medications, of course, always play a factor into things. In the aspect of your potential things uh, with thyroidism, this is the person that has the intolerance, they're sweating all the time, weight loss, um, the tremorous fatigues. Okay, so what type of, uh, what symptoms or, or what, um, uh, I'm blanking here, never mind. Uh, basically what I was trying to get to is the aspect of your, the, the patient looks like they're having a whole bunch of epinephrine running around, or they have a whole bunch of adrenaline. For you guys here, um, treatment is not much um, except for getting them to an ALS provider. Okay, so paramedics and all stuff for you know for you, Mark, the aspect of you know starting IVs, getting fluids is about the biggest thing. Um, now, some of the <coughs> the paramedics instead of giving propanolol, um, they can give metoprolol or labetalol, um, one of the, the beta blockers. But the purple thiouracil or the iodine or the dexamethasone, that's really not much of options in the free hospital. Okay. So like everything else, majority of the stuff treatment for you guys is what? Board of care, very good. All right. Yeah, I know, you guys do support me well. <laughs> so hyperpanolol. What propanolol does is it decreases the heart rate, decreases the tremors, um, and then from there, propanolol by itself um, for the medics um, is that it goes through and it helps actually block the conversion of T4 to T3. All right, um, and then what PTU or uh, methamazole, um, they block the synthesis of thyroid hormone. Uh, and then when we give, going back in the whole thing of iodine, 
um, is ultimately that stops the conversion and the breakdown of or the formation of the hormone. And then dexamethasone, um, the last thing it does is it blocks the conversion. Um, and the other thing that we can do, and a lot of this is inside the hospital, um, which is taking um, plasmapheresis and, or charcoal plasmapheresis to colon, the circulating thyroids, thyroxins, and all that stuff out. So again, grave disease um, is the most common thing that you see for someone that's hyperthyroidism. Okay, so they have ectopus. This is the bug eyes. Okay, have you ever seen someone walk around? They got the, the big eyes and all that stuff. Um, the, and then, of course, the second common thing is going to be the goiter um, that you'll see. Exactly. It is female. Um, sometimes they'll get the goiter, they'll get the, um, the ectothalamus problems, and then um, usually it's the female's third and fourth decade of life. Um, can also occur during pregnancy where the parasite is affecting things. Exactly. The parasite within. Thyroid storm is just another um, sign so that your hyperthyroidism with, okay, fever, tachycardia, mental status changes. So if you have that person up in the slot machines or, and they start acting weird, okay, and they have a history of thyroid problems, or if they're on Synthroid or something like this, this could be the, one of the things to think about. Okay. So again, what would you guys do? You get called up there. This is the interactive time. Okay. Need them. All right, so yeah, so doing your sample history and all that stuff, um, of course, um, checking blood sugars and, and think about other potential causes. But again, thyroid storm is one of those things that you want to potentially think about. So goal stabilization, airway protection, oxygen, and IV fluids. Um, can't really do that here, but on the outline. Um, and then getting back into the aspect of treatment, it's for the medics and all that stuff. You know, beta blocker is one of the first things. Propanolol is the ideal drug, but you know, all that we're carrying predominantly is metropolol. And the other things, other three things really can't do much there. Getting to the hospital and, and letting the doctors know. My little bash on the four. Yeah. Um, hyperthyroidism, again, um, getting back into the aspect um, females more than males. Um, so the, the endocrine problems, most endocrine problems are more females than males, um, unlike most everything else where males actually dominate um, the problems. Uh, again, getting in the aspect of autoimmune, um, just like Graves' disease and hyperthyroidism, um, you have Hashimoto's thyroiditis um, is the most common cause or feature that you get for hyperthyroidism. Um, and then you have other things, idiopathic, or they can actually, if they take out the thyroid, ablate the thyroid, or if they have iodine deficiency. Okay, Why doesn't America really have iodine deficiency anymore? What? And why is that important? Not why is it, what is, what about the soil though? Yeah, so they, back in the 60s, they were seeing that people were iodine deficiency. So the Morton Salt Company started combining iodine into the salt. So, so that's why you have your history. Um, and then of course, um, anything postpartum um, with the females and all that stuff. Uh, typical, the aspect of what they look like, they're um, dry core.
hair, um, thinning of the eyebrows, they get the, the periorbital edema, um, and the puffy face and dry skin. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you get called to a 65-year-old woman um, at a ECF for altermental status and bradycardia. Okay, um, you first noticed today by the ECF staff. This is so. This is the the typical 7 a.m. No one really saw her overnight. Okay, um, she had a history of a couple of uh, a couple of, uh, CVAs. Does have hypothyroidism. She's on aspirin and Synthroid. Okay. So you walk into this room and you see this lady that's just basically laying there, unresponsive, bradycardic, cool to touch. What do you do? Sternal rub doesn't respond. What? Pulse. Check for a pulse. She has a pulse. She's breathing very slowly. She's and she has a slow pulse. Okay, not a breather. Blood pressure is high, is low. Sugar is okay. 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 So Narcan doesn't do. He actually had normal sized pupils prior to that. Okay. So get ALS rolling. Glucose check, O2, okay. So what are we doing? This is an endocrine problem. So what type of endocrine problem? This is a worst case type endocrine problem. Sugar is normal. Nope, breathing just shallow. Slow. No one here? Okay. Blood pressure is low. So everything's low. Okay. So blood pressure 80 pal, thrust was 10, temp 92, pulse 44, cold to touch, minimal responsive. Let's just protecting her area. Okay. Rescue guard using the spring. Okay. Everybody know what condition we're talking about here? Endocrine wise? Right. Mixed edema coma. <laughs> <laughs> I know. This is why we're doing this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not all of them do. Now, again, this is patients that have hypothyroidism, and it's this is the most of the mixed edema comas are the 60s, 70s, 80 year olds. Okay. Um, they have long standing hypothyroidism, um, geriatric population, um, comatose, and all that stuff. And the, usually the big thing is getting. Okay. We know that most older people, they'll get some form of infection and then they have problems. Uh, but of course, medical compliance, non compliance, they don't take their synthroid or something like that. All right. Cold exposure is another factor, especially in Toledo, Ohio. Um, and then any different medications, all that stuff. So again, just going to the aspect of their mental status, hypothyroid or the hypothermic, bradycardic, not breathing well. So the exact opposite of your thyroid storm. So thyroid storm is fever, altered, tachycardic, sweating a lot. Mixed edema coma is the exact opposite. Hypothermic, bradycardic, hypoventilating. As we know, what's the what is the purpose of the thyroid hormone? Wait, yeah, metabolism. Okay, so the thyroid the the thyroid stuff is all about metabolism. Underactive thyroid. That's what most of them say, anyways. <laughs> um, physical exam, of course, screen to the hypothermia, hyperventilation, tension, uh, bradycardia, and then also mental status. 
Equipment, again, what you guys already talked about, ABCs, fluid risk rate of the hyponatremia, um, and then looking for any of the precipitating factors. Into the hyperparathyroidism, uh, if you remember back into biology, um, where do the par where do the parathyroids lay? Parathyroids, we have four of them. They're in the they're right into the thyroid, so they're usually indented little balls into the you have each of the pole of the thyroid. If you remember, the the thyroid looks like a little bow tie, so it's on the edges of the bow tie, um, and then from have uh, either a primary or secondary causes for hyperparathyroidism. Um, symptoms can be vague um, in the aspect of fatigue, weakness, vomiting type stuff. Um, and then ultimately for you guys, it's really just providing supportive care. They have the polyurea, or polydipsia type things, dehydration. Um, so a lot of it is the um, all the symptoms of hypercalcemia, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so the um, moan, moan, or uh, the moans, groans, psychiatric overtones. Uh, so things that think about with hypercalcemia, uh, anorexia, constipation, um, just because the the calcium is not working. Um, so on EKGs, one of the things to think about. Uh, with the hypercalcemia, so the whole bunch of the parathyroid is increased, so its job is to basically leach calcium from the bone. Okay, so what it does is it pulls the bones and it throws um, the calcium into the bloodstream. Um, and what you get here is the QT stuff. So for you, you're looking at monitors when you're out in Oregon, okay? Um, so you can even QT prolongation and all that stuff. Okay. <laughs> so treatment for the hypercalcemia, um, the biggest thing is just, so if you're seeing QT prolongation or QT shortening uh, for the hypercalcemia um, is giving them fluids. Uh, a lot of times in the ER we'll start I'll push Lasix is one of the first things, um, and then corticosteroids, but again, you guys don't have to worry about anything like that. Um, hypocalcemia, or the flip side of the parathyroid, um, if you don't have enough parathyroid hormone, um, this is when you get into the CATS, which is the convulsions, the arrhythmias, the tetanies, and the spasms. And the hypocalcemia, again, it's, you know, thinking about a endocrine problem, okay, it's usually a destruction of the parathyroids, either they removed them or they've, um, they were doing something with the thyroid and they cut it out. Um, all you need is one parathyroid gland to be able to maintain enough calcium in the body. Uh, some people, they take too much magnesium. So if they, the, um, they're having problems with constipation and they take the milk of mag, um, or they're, sorry, they're, uh, they're not taking enough and all that stuff. Um, the other thing, so 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol, which is the vitamin D. Uh -huh. Patients that we see with this is going to be your, your renal patients. Um, drugs can cause a lot of that stuff too. Okay. Um, uptake of calcium, so they have poor calcium and bone disease, hungry bone stuff, um, and then of course the binding of calcium. Um, the Blanking out right now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'd have to look that one back up again. Um, but the biggest thing, of course, the um, calcium binds and to albumin is another piece of the puzzle. I mean, there's some people with 
bless you. Some people's pancreatitis. Uh, for those people that are transporting blood or they're working in the ER or something like that, um, one of my first patients that I saw, with, they went to a PEA, was after giving blood transfusions because the calcium, um, all the, the citrate in the blood products basically leaks the calcium out of it. And that's how we, that's how blood products are kept and all that stuff, is through by using calciums. Okay. So in the acute hypercalcemia, uh, the things that we're looking at. The, oh, nothing. The QT prolongation is the first one that you'll see on the monitors. Um, hypertension, bradycardia. Uh, and the, what's the Chavosky signs or Trusco signs? And that's back to EMS, if you guys remember. Okay. We'll show them in a second. So in the aspect of the other uh, complaints is just your perioral numbness, uh, paresthesias, muscle camping. Um, patients can actually have seizures because of low calcium levels, which again goes back into the cat. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they both deal with the nerves. Okay. On the Trevosky sign, what you do is the um, mucal. Um, it's the masseter muscle. So if you were to, if they have low calcium and you um, tap on their cheek, they would their cheeks would actually spasm. Um, unlike the torso signs or the carpal pedal, or the, the the carpal, um, if you were to tuck, um, tap into their middle, um, they could they will actually their hands will contract. Yep. And I was just showed a good YouTube video of this. I can download that right for this. So yeah, if you just tap on the the wrist, they'll actually the wrist and all that stuff will flex. EKG wise, again gets into the QT prolongation uh, for the hypocalcemia. Uh, so anything over 0.46 is the biggest thing. Questions so far? That's about the thyroids, the parathyroids. All right. Everyone staying awake? Hard? It's a new turn. That's fine. <clears throat> Into the adrenals. Okay. So, adrenals, there's yeah, two pieces for the adrenal glands. Um, you either have the medulla or the cortex. Um, so the cortex is your salt, sweet, and the sex um, versus the medulla is your stress. Okay. You have um, three um, hormones produced in the cortex, the GFR, which is your, um, that's basically how the layering of it is. Uh, and then from there, the medulla, your epinephrine, your norepinephrine. So if you think about the, the location of the adrenals, uh, they sit like a little on top of the kidneys. So how you put a little beret hat on, it just flops over. Um, that's what the adrenals look like. Um, they do look yellow in nature if you were to go in and cut them out. <clears throat> on cortisol, uh, typically response are, this is part of the ACTH from the anterior to pituitary. Um, in ACTH releases it for trauma, infections are the, the major problems, uh, but also at times when we have hypoglycemia um, and then anytime you increase epinephrine. So when, every time we have a catecholamine surge, ACTH is released. So the function of cortisol, of course, is to decrease glucose uptake, um, it, the fat breakdown, um, and then it, from there it governs um, partly with the water stuff. Um, and the next one, the mineral corticoids, also has an effect in that. Catecholamines are, actually helps with catecholamines and all that stuff. 
giving good contractions to the heart, constricting the arterioles, and that helps with blood pressure. On the salt, <laughs> okay. Uh, the your middle, the major one is aldosterone. Uh, this is where you get into the lemon angiotensin aldosterone system from the kidneys. So we don't have enough blood pressure, okay, or you don't have enough fluid. So what the kidneys sense that and it, it causes the renin, which in turn causes the release of angiotensin from the lungs, and then back to the kidneys, or um, it, which is the release of the aldosterone and all that stuff. Um, increase in sodium absorption um, and kicks potassium out. So wherever sodium goes, water follows. So that's what increases our blood pressure and all that stuff. And then of course the androgens um, part was with your the sex metabolism and all that stuff. You have two different types of adrenal stuff, either a primary or secondary, um, Addison's disease, or you can get the adrenal hemorrhages, which we'll talk about both of those, um, and then just fail from the pituitary gland. And diagnosing it for you guys is it's not really a concern. Um, that's more of into the hospital. Uh, JFK um, was probably the most notorious person with the uh, Addison's disease or primary adrenal insufficiency. Um, and again, it's just the destruction of the renal cortex. Um, and they're thinking that it's most likely autoimmune. Um, they do have some cases known with tuberculosis and fungal. So potential rise or potentially seeing more of this with an increase in tuberculosis that we're starting to see more of, secondary to HIV. So in the bilateral adrenal hemorrhages, um, the most common one is called water house frequency syndrome, um, which is the metacoxemia uh, septicemia, which I'll show you a picture in a second. Um, other things though, patients that are on heparin, uh, so your dialysis patients. Um, so if they're coming in and they're having uh, problems, um, they can actually see one of the pictures in a second, um, where they just basically the body is shutting down. Okay, and they get um, this is the non-blanching, uh, non-palpable type purpura um, that you see more commonly with the meningococcemia. Okay. So they're good one minute, and two hours later, they look like this, and they're clumping in front of you. Oh, uh, yeah. Quick. Uh, don't know. I've never felt it. Yeah. So this is um, severe case of meningococcemia. Um, they're dead within 12 hours from onset. Uh, hypertension. Pain, of course, um, epigastric pain, have vomiting, nausea, um, and of course, all the mental status. And again, this is from the aspect of when you're destroying the, the cortex, um, you don't have the cortisol anymore, and you don't have the mineral cortisol, so that's why you're intensive. Um, and then, of course, the cortisol with the blood sugars and the altered mental status. So, on the overall aspect of your um, mineral corticoids, uh, sorry, of your primary ad, ad, primary adrenal insufficiencies, okay? Um, weight loss, abdominal pain, diarrhea, the brownish pigment, why do their skin look uh, a tan color? You know, back to high school biology. This is where you're, again, if you're getting back into the feedback loops, okay? The primary hormone that increases the adrenals is partly the melatonin and all that stuff, yeah, but it has a factor. Your ACTH, okay, the adrenal corticotropin hormone, it has a factor with melatonin and all that stuff. So it increases that, and that gets the, the pigmented skin. And of course, then you have the loss of the nail beds and actually hair in the females and all that stuff. So in cortisol, when we lose that, we get anorexic, nausea, um, lethargy, the hypoglycemic, um, and then shock just from minor stressors. 
Um, when we lose aldosterone, um, we're dehydration, hypertension, um, and then any of the or uh, even problems with cardiac output. Uh, anorexia is the, there's, anorexia bulimia is a psychological thing. Anorexia by is, I don't want to eat. So they just see their appetite, they don't have appetite or anything like that. And then azotemia, <clears throat> where you have basically swelling in the body and all that stuff. So in the labs, <clears throat> not much for you guys. Check glucose, um, and then uh, for EMS screws and all that stuff, uh, looking at the ECG. Uh, do you have fight and key weight, prolonged QT, prolongation, uh, mobile type stuff. On secondary or tertiary AI, um, secondary is usually just obstruction of the pituitary. Tertiary, of course, is one step higher. So the hypothalamic dysfunction. Um, so getting really into the brain. And the aspect, though, um, aldosterone is not affected because the <clears throat> getting back into the feedback loop, um, the running energy and tension aldosterone system, that should, uh, but you can have hypoglycemia and all that stuff. So there's a couple of the, the syndromes. Uh -huh. Cushing's disease, have you guys heard of? Cushing's syndrome? Yes, no, maybe so, bad? Okay. So what, what do patients look like with Cushing's disease? Bueller, Bueller. Um, dry something, yep. Okay. So they get the uh, big, they get the moon face, the round face, the hump back, okay, which is the buffalo hump. Um, if you look at their belly, they get distended abdomen. Um, they had the purple striae. Um, the, Pregnant females, um, how they get that, the streaking and all that stuff. Uh, ecchymosis, they easily bruise thin skin, um, and then slow wound healing and all that stuff. Mm, kind of, sort of. Uh, this is going to be your moon face, and sometimes it's a little reddened and all that stuff. So for you guys, the aspect of management, just caution because of the fragile skin, um, and then um, anything else treatment-wise, you know, if they have sugar problems or something like that, then taking care of that. Yes, that's Monday. Yeah, margarita today. All right. So case 36-year-old patient was ultimental, taking steroids to uh, control Crohn's disease, uh, but she's been out of medication for two days. Okay. Um, she's using on high cortisone, five milligrams, uh, but she's out, and she's also on a couple other medications, allergy to penicillin, uh, heart rate 80, blood pressure 70 over 45, uh, temperature is normal, GCS 11, dark pigmented skin, um, AccuCheck of 54. Okay. 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 Actually, 95% is my bad. Okay. And glucose. Uh, how do I give her glucose? Okay. GCS of 11. Okay, maybe a little square of, of oral on the cheek. IV, yep. Okay. okay. What's causing all this? Okay. 
Is it the Crohn's acting up? Crohn's disease? Uh-huh. So adrenal crisis. Uh -huh. So the cause of it is if she's um, if your patient's on long-standing steroids, they're long-standing glucocorticoids, so the prednisone. Uh -huh. And this is something that you guys might see here. So you probably have a lot of patients that are on a lot of the immunologic or the elderly elderly patient. They're on prednisone, okay, and they're on long-standing prednisone, and they you know, go away, and they've you know they've been here for a couple of days and left the medications at home. They say, "Oh, I can take care of this." Right? And this is what you'll see: the nausea, vomiting, skips into the more of the lethargy, um, the hypoglycemic, the hypotensive. Um, basically, their body has been so used to having their oral glucocorticoid or the prednisone for so long that the body itself stopped making its own. Um, they have the brown color skin because you have no feedback suppression. Um, and the aspect of that is they have, again, going back into ACTH, melatonin, and all that stuff. Okay. So cortisol and aldosterone um, can't be met. That's where you get the whole thing with the adrenal crisis. How'd you get here? Iatrogenic, usually the, uh, we give it to them. And this, again, goes back into the aspect of the prednisone. Um, this is why you always hear patients, um, they're on a prednisone taper. You know, why, you know, the, the patient is on 14 days of prednisone or something like that. Because uh, anything over seven days, we know it's a problem. Trauma, surgeries, burns, pregnancies, the, of course, the other big one. Infections, trauma, surgeries, uh, of course, uh, we're going back down to the whole thing lack of medications and all that stuff. Diagnosis treatment, of course, pre-hospital, just take care of the hypertension, given sugar, um, supportive measures. Um, and then um, into the ED, um, we give them hydrocortisone, um, something like that. Um, fluids, all depending on what it is, D5 normal, normal saline, dextrose, um, corrected blood sugar, corrected blood pressure. Yeah. Questions? Okay. So, so again, an aspect of going from the top down, we talked about the thyroid, um, the two symptoms of the things, um, getting into the Graves disease or Hashim or in um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, so they're either having a thyroid storm, rapid temperature, blood pressure, heart rate, all that stuff, fever, all that is, um, versus the Hashimoto's where they're slowing down. Um, then of course the worst problem with the thyroid is, is getting into the um, the thyroid storm is the worst for uh, too much is the myxedema coma, okay, for too slow. Then we talked about the parathyroid, either too much or too little, and that's a lot of that has to do with calcium. And calcium, we can see what with on ECGs. What? QT stuff, okay. So the QT is either really slow or really long. i oh, sorry, really really long or very short. So in hypocalcemia, you'll see short QT. Hypocalcemia, you'll see a long QT. Um, then we just talked about the adrenal side of it. Um, so you can have your primary or secondary, okay, depending on the, and we didn't talk about the medulla, uh, damage of medulla, course, all that's with your epinephrine and norepinephrine. But you usually don't see a problem with that. So getting into Addison's disease versus Cushing syndrome, okay? Addison's is usually more with primary, where you have aldosterone problems, the Cushing's is with the glucocorticoids, or the sugar problems. 
mean face. The last organ we'll talk about, um, the pancreas. Um, multiple. Oh, do you guys want to take a break? Okay. Um, pancreas, just the aspect of, has multiple organs. Um, the pancreas actually both has an endocrine system and an exogen or endo, exo, exoderm system, um, where the part of it is. Um, it doesn't stay within the blood system, and actually all of your digestive enzymes get dumped into the um, intestines. Um, but this then also has your insulin and your glucagon, um, and that's where the endocrine piece of it comes into play. Yes. No. The... No, the major correlation with pancreatic cancer is smoking. That's the huge thing. Um, that or they'll have, um, or they've had pancreatitis, which in turn leads to their, uh, the, the cancer and all that stuff. Um, and that can, of course, can be anything for your pancreatitis or your alcoholics um, is the most common cause. You can have um, idiopath. Um, there's some known cases of scorpion bites um, with pancreatitis and all that stuff. Arizona. Um, so your pancreas, of course, is broken up into uh, multiple different types of cells, the alpha cells um, or the beta cells. Um, alpha is your glucagon, which raises your blood sugar, and the beta cells um, is going to be your insulin, which lowers your blood sugar. Um, so that's your, your islets of Langerhans. Remember that. Important. Yeah. <clears throat> Glucose, primary energy source. Um, we can get it from multiple different ways, uh, multiple foods prominently. Uh, but from the liver with the gluconeogenesis, um, and then they uh, do have some stored stuff in the glycogen um, in the muscles and the livers. Um, so this is the thing where uh, if we can't get sugar into them, we can't get an IV, the medications that we give. Correct. Okay. Giving them glucagon. Okay. So in a patient that is in liver failure or your chronic alcoholics, what's the problem with them? They're depleting, yeah. So they're depleting the sugar, okay, but they don't have the glycogen stores. So if they're already, so the, if you get on scene and you have someone that's a chronic alcoholic and you can't get an IV in and their blood sugar is low and you want to push glucagon, it might not work because it's not going to increase their, their glucose levels. You can give them oral, yeah, they need, oral or they need IV dextrose. Uh, but if they are altered and you, you can't give them oral, then that's something to take into consideration if you have those patients. Insulin, uh, produced by islets, the beta cells um, used to help sugar. Um, so sugar can't cross um, most cells uh, membrane, okay? So that's where the insulin comes along and it actually acts as a traffic cop or a, um, a school bus monitor where it actually takes the insulin and it helps the insulin get across. Um, of course, the brain doesn't need it. It has its own abilities. Insulin stimulates fat production, glucose storage, decreases glucose production, um, and it helps um, decrease protein and muscle breakdown. It's the building up type hormone. Um, insulin builds up, glucagon and epinephrine basically break down. Okay. Um, so after running a marathon or after you just had a, um, a scare, okay, someone scared you um, and you tested your blood sugar, it would be elevated because of the epinephrine release and all that stuff. And again, why do we want a lot of blood sugar in our 
in our psalm if we're scared. Correct, for the fight or flight symptoms, okay? We need all that sugar there to be able to have it to break down to build ATP for energy to get the heck out of there. All right. So there's method to the madness. Um, on the fed state, um, you can after three hours after feeding, you have increased insulin levels. Um, carbohydrates are converted to storage. Um, fasting state, um, about four hours after. Um, Within the four to 24 hours, you actually start seeing glycogenesis um, from the liver and all that stuff, which is the breakdown of your uh, glycogen stores. Um, so if you're not eating, you know that stuff. Um, anything beyond 24 hours, you have a group of neogenesis, where they actually take uh, amino acids from your muscles and start converting it into um, or they actually the um, glucose type medication or glucose type complexes and that gets into the Krebs cycle which I don't think you guys want to talk about right now Bam. We probably had all these. 22 year old seizure activity. Sister noticed shaking in the sleep. Um, he's an insulin dependent diabetic, NPH, lisinopril, no allergies, denies any drugs, alcohol, or tobacco. All right. Vitals are stable, physical exam. He's confused. GCS of 12. Sugar is 35. All right. What's wrong with him? Why? Okay. Um, or. Uh huh. No fever. He's just confused. Yeah. Okay. So, or was he didn't? I mean, he's just on a long acting insulin. Okay. Didn't take any extra insulin. Meters broke. Okay. He sees though. Let me see this so often. This is a common thing. Why do patients seize when their sugars are low? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what needs glucose? What body system needs glucose? It can only use glucose. Uh, they can actually do amino acids and all that. You're thinking too hard. <laughs> yes. The brain. <laughs> yep. So the brain is that's the primary organ that needs glucose. It can only use glucose and maybe a little bit of ketones later in life when you get a DKA, but that's a different story. It doesn't produce its own. It doesn't need insulin to get it. Yeah. So the brain doesn't have glucose, so it gets pissed off and it sends off all the electrical problems, and that's why you seize. So the hypoglycemia definition, of course, is less than 50. Um, in our protocols, less than 60. Um, the other thing, though, is are they having signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, meaning are they shaky, fast heartbeat, sweating, dizzy, anxious, um, headaches, they're full. Okay. What medication can some people, predominantly older people, take that can blunt this symptoms? Make it so it doesn't, sorry, make it so it doesn't show. And you have a whole bunch of people upstairs right now that are probably taking medications like this. Not blood thinners. 
Beta blockers, yep. So remember the beta blockers, okay? So anyone on a beta blocker, um, they can have problems. So in the aspect of protocol-wise, um, if they're having low blood sugar um, and you give them um, one of the things with, like, with epinephrine, if the epinephrine doesn't work, or in the glucagon, so the glucagon reverses beta blockers. All right. So something to take into consideration, um, that they might not be irritable, they might not be anxious, because all this stuff is they're not shaking, because that's the release when you get into epinephrine release or the adrenaline release. That's why they're shaky. That's why they're irritable. That's why they're anxious. Okay, they could just be out of it. But that's all that you're going to see. Causes, of course, um, oral medications. There's a whole more to the list. Um, insulin, overdose, liver disease, um, alcoholics, uh, people that just don't eat toxic stuff, um, kids that do Skittle parties and they just dump their mother's beta blockers or calcium channel blockers into the, the, the bowl. Uh, of course, infections always has a problem. So, yes, you guys are right. They haven't eaten their last meal. They took their insulin and then they dropped. Um, or they've had their medication dosages changed and all that stuff. Meters reading. Yep. Improper meters and all that stuff. Okay. So, blood, so the aspect, if you think about it, two different pathways. Um, the brain doesn't go, so you have, guess we get altered, uh, the seizures, the headaches. Or the other aspect with the adrenal glands, um, that causes the release of epinephrine. Um, that's where you get the tachycardias, the blood pressure issues, the sweatings, the nausea, and all that stuff. Pale school skin, all that stuff. They kind of sort of look like a insulin shock, or they have a, that's the term that they use sometimes, that they're an insulin shock. So I'm the neuroglycopenic versus the hyperepinephric mnemic. Um, that's just the aspects of what they're looking at, same things that we talked about. Also mental seizures versus the nervous system irritability. Treatment, of course, 15 grams, 25 grams per kilogram from pediatrics. If you can put uh, IVs in, um, D50, 1 to 2 ml per kg, which is usually an amp. Um, pediatric population, um, D25, uh, 2 to 4 ml per kg. Um, and then if they're under 10 kilograms, of course, just remember to use the D10 or D12.5 if you're going to half dose the D25. Uh, glucagon if you can't get IV access. Um, and I'm working out right now potentially for EMTs um, to be able to do intranasal glucagon so in the future, potentially for you guys. Um, and that's purely for the simple fact that so often you guys get unseen and uh, can't do anything because they're altered and they can't, they have no gag reflex. Um, well, it's all liquid. And then if you think about anyone that has the nutritional deficiencies, it's, you know, give them a thiamine. And that's just to help prevent the chronic and coast call syndromes. Check, AccuCheck, you know, 30 minutes, the next couple hours. Uh, any patients that's taking oral medications that are hypoglycemic, where do they need to go? What? Uh, no. What location do they need to go to if they're on oral medications and they're hypoglycemic? Yes. Thank you, sir. They must go to the hospital. They can't stay home. They can't sign off per the protocol. Actually, goals. What? Yeah. Natural. Yeah, All right. So the diabetes, um, we have two types. Um, the one which is the traditional. Uh, there was the juvenile onset, or the type two, which is the adult onset, which we know that is no longer true. Um, that's why they changed the names from juvenile onset or adult onset, type 1, type 2. 
uh, different causes for it, secondary causes, of course, alcohol, cystic fibrosis. What? Where's where's that? Gestation, and of course, getting into the gestational diabetes. Squirrel. <laughs> All right. Type one, um, getting into that, it's no longer the adult, or sorry, the, the juvenile onset, because we, we have adults that are now that develop type one. Um, this is the insulin, they have insulin problems. Usually, those adults that develop the type one, they were type two, and then their pancreas just stopped working altogether. So it's, I'm done. I give up. Um, predominantly, uh, autoimmune is the major thing. Um, infections, uh, breastfeeding issues, diet, socioeconomic status always plays a, a de facto. Um, unlike type 2, um, this is the insulin production. Um, and a lot of it is the, they have insulin resistance, uh, meaning their body's still building. Uh, they're still making the insulin, but it's just not working uh, well enough. Um, usually that's controlled with diet, oral medications, um, and then ultimately if it gets bad enough, getting into the insulin injection. So type 2, usually these are the patients, sedentary lifestyle, um, over 50, history of uh, blood pressure problems, um, their bees, uh, infections, and then their blood sugars, you know, usually to the greater than 126. In the U.S., uh, type 1, males greater than females. Um, type 2, males equals females. Um, Non-Hispanic whites. I just can't say Caucasian, but that's how it came about. Uh, versus greater than Africans versus black versus Hispanics. Uh, type 2, uh, blacks um, with Mexicans and then Japanese. Uh, Native Americans are making a strong push for this. Uh, and then the whites. Um, on the type 1, of course, it's just the aspect of we have the loss of the beta cells. Okay. And what's producing the alpha cells? Uh, beta cells is insulin. The alpha cells are is. Ooh. Ooh, gone. Yeah. That's where your alpha cells are. Um, and type 2 is just the insulin resistance. Most people, for the first time, coming in if they're a type 1, and this is your you know, 4 year old kid that is complaining of you know, polyuria, polydipsia, the peeing all the time. You know, I, I don't know if everyone's had stories of family members or friends or something like this. Okay. Uh, versus the type 2 slow in, in insidious. Um, these are the patients that they're, they've been on steroids or something like that a long time or they just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. Uh, most of the symptoms, of course, just their polyuria, polydipsia, uh, polyphasia, fatigue, uh, weight loss, uh, blurred vision. They can have um, their vaginitis, candidal infections. They get the candida on the breast, under the skin folds, and all that stuff. Symptoms greater than 200, plasma, glucose fasting greater than 126. And then, of course, there's a couple other ways to test for it. Um, other medications, diuretics, convulsive beta blockers can have a problem with this. Um, and then, of course, non-compliance is always a huge factor. So on the acute hyperglycemia, okay, for you guys, not much to do with the guys' protocols, okay? And for the advanced EMTs, paramedics, um, you can, of course, you know, put IV in, start IV hydration. Um, yeah, try to dilute it down. Uh, just remember that it takes time to get there, so it takes time to... Um, we don't correct someone's sugar rapidly. Um, there's a, a couple problems that can occur with, with rapid...
fraction, which we're not going to talk about. Complications, of course, with having high blood sugars a lot. We all know this stuff. They have eye problems, kidney problems, um, nervous problems. Infection is a huge thing. You know, this is the high blood sugar is the leading cause of renal failure and then hypertension with it. That's why we have a lot of, of blacks, you know, that have a lot of them are on dialysis and all that stuff because they have, they're prone to both um, having high blood pressure and sugar problems and all that stuff. So a couple things just with the insulin pumps. Um, this is the newest thing that's been around for you know what 10, 15 years now. Um, new advances now that they are um, what it can do, and basically the pump is a little mini pancreas uh, can malfunction occasionally. Um, you know, Dr. Newmeyer talks about his cases that he's had before with himself, um, and then from there. If you do have a patient on, that's on a pump, of course, um, and if they're low or something like that, first thing to do is just take them off the pump. Just It has right here in the port, just grab that and it just unclicks or even just if you have to pull it from the, the port site and all that stuff. Different measures, um, different pumps have different ways that can actually, some of them are sensing um, now that they have a little implanted device. Um, that it senses the blood and then it squirts out what you need. So again, just like what you eat uh, and yeah, uh, you know, so from that aspect, it's it's really it's it's amazing what some of these things are doing now. Yeah. So, 53 year old patient, worsening vomiting, headache, abdominal pain, 12 hours. Uh, she's been seen for several episodes before. Um, now, with uh, dyspnea and sweating, no chest pain, um, history, diabetes, arthritis, hypertension. She's on gliburide, insulin, um, aspirin. Okay. Heart rate 150, uh, respiratory syndrome, tachy, she's diaphoretic, ovarian, hyperventilating, mucous membranes, and I can check regions. Hi. Hi. That's all you get. Hi. That's all you get. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So your acutex says hi. So what does what does this patient have? High blood sugar. Specifically, what does she have? Okay. And what condition does she have? She's a type one. Well, she's she's a one and a two. Nope. No, that's why her sugar is high. <laughs> so again, the aspect of not all, it's not the DKA is not a young thing, okay? Anybody that's on insulin could potentially have problems getting the DKA or the diabetic ketoacidosis. You guys remember the Kuzmol's breathing? Okay, so that's the rapid breathing that they get from that. So in DKA, there's three pieces of it. They have the ketone production, they have the acidosis, which is the so the diabetic, which is the glucose, ketone, acidosis. Those are the three things that you have to have for DKA. I mean, really with this, predominantly seen more into the younger, you know, truly insulin dependent are the ones with the DKAs. But I've seen patients DKAs being on you know oral medications. And then that's not longer working. They're supposed to be, that's a, one of the telltale signs. 
again, insulin and all that stuff. So cells starve, they develop gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Um, that's where you start getting into the fatty acid formation. Um, you have increase in the glucose, uh, which causes osmotic diuresis. They're spilling the glucose and it pulls the water with it. Um, and that increases all the problems. Um, the body doesn't know what to do. So it starts increasing your aldosterone, which starts taking out potassium because it's trying to save water. Um, that's where you get your elevated sodium levels and all that stuff. Um, and they go into a, what's called a hyperchloremic acidosis. Too much fluoride ion. Stress, infection, some we don't know why, but there's a huge factor that plays into it. Um, of course, sugar greater than 250, and it's clinical. You know, we know, yep, blood sugar elevated, they look like crap. Okay, they're in acute you know, acidosis. I don't really care what caused it. Um, but then from there, the you guys won't test for this stuff, but this is what we're testing for in the ED. Treatment fluids, um, some can be down five to 10 liters. Um, usually you get the first liter for uh, advanced and paramedics and all that stuff. After that, it's slowly hydrating. Um, you're, you know, don't want to really drop them too fast. The cerebral edema and all that stuff, specifically kids. Bicarbonate, usually in the ER, we don't really use bicarbonate much anymore unless they're under seven. So they're really acidotic. But even that down to acidosis to 6.9, where we're even pushing giving bicarb. Um, complications, um, infections, MIs, um, of course, the therapies, because uh, we're giving the insulin, which will cause the hypochalamia. Um, cerebral edema is the worst case scenario uh, for driving too much, driving the sugar down too fast. The brain will swell, again, goes back into the osmotic diuresis and all that. And then infections and shock. Okay. Got a 100-year-old diabetic, demented, just not acting right. Okay. 135, 80, reads high. Again, she's... Mucous membrane is dry. She's on just glucophage, not on insulin anymore. Uh -huh. And she hasn't been eating, and they only changed her fully back three times. So, what does she have? Dehydrated, yep. Okay. So it's not the IV. We know kind of sort of that she's hyperglycemic. Okay. Is she in DKA? Yes, no, maybe so. Or, or is she in a different syndrome? So there's actually something that your non-insulin dependence, older patients get, okay, called HHNK, hyperosmolar hypoglycemic non-ketotic syndrome. Um, what they do is they have all, they have everything similar to a DKA patient except they're not still in ketones, okay? They still have enough insulin in their body to push it across so they don't have that the fatty acid breakdown, which in turn that's what causes the ketone production. Diabetics, infection is the most common cause, older patients, but you can see it in dialysis and, the, and all that stuff. Um, and some people on the parental nutrition or the IV nutrition can also have this. So they're still burning the sugar, but they just can't get it and all that stuff. Uh, they do get the polyuria, thirst, polydipsia, and all that. Okay. So they don't have the ketone production 
Okay, so for the ketones, I can't smell it. Some people can smell the fruity breath or the nail polish removal. That's what the ketones. I can never smell it. Um, and again, they're severely depleted, 68 liters down, just like the DKAs. Questions on blood sugar issues? Hyperglycemia, hyperglycemia, anything like that? Nothing. All right. A couple quick things left, and then we'll we'll get done. I told you an hour and a half. Roughly. Um, just remember the aspect of refusals and, and, and documentation of refusals. Um, this is in the protocols one of the big thing to do is you know, patient okay so you're diabetic and what's the other patient population that you can sign off as a treatment release actually the two other populations the diabetics asthmatics people that have been tased that's going to jail okay so just on the protocol wise, everyone else for the most part, in my opinion, is an AMA. So how many people take each block? Yeah. I know it's the protocol. Uh-huh. No, if they meet criteria again. And the criteria is over 18, over, over 18, not complaining of any chest pain. They're not on any drugs. They're not altered. Well, if they're complaining of chest pain, then yes, yeah. that's part of the protocol. They have to go to, to the hospital to get checked out. But, I mean, if they're not complaining of anything, then you, no, they don't need to go to the hospital. And you watch them for 20 minutes to make sure that they don't have any tetany or any problems or anything like that. You know, they don't need an EKG and all that stuff. So, but we diverge. Uh, if they have a heart problems, then yes, they should go and all that stuff. Not complaining of anything. Yeah, because there's the possibility of problems. Yeah. So on the refusal, of course, with the diabetics, um, must be diabetic, insulin dependent only if they're on oral hypoglycemics, that doesn't count. Oral hypoglycemics should go to the hospital, just be monitored. Um, if not, you'll be back there in an hour or two because their sugar will be um, over 18 or they have a minor or a parent with them. Um, they have no other medical problems. They're not a danger to themselves. They're not dependent, hypoxic, no traumas. So GCS greater than 15 and they're um, conscious blood and oriented times four. Um, of course, contact med control, questions for the diabetic to ask. You know, rich illnesses on the oral medications. Um, if you tell me, yeah, they're on metformin and they're they were low, guess what I'm going to tell you? You contact med control. I'm not going to allow you to sign them off. Uh, medications, orals, and then from there, they have to have a family and friend. Um, and then, of course, do they have an accurate acting glucometer? Um, and sometimes. You know, 120, but you get there, bless you. You know, and yours said it was 50, so sometimes they might need to have their glucometer checked. That's too much. 500. 100. Yeah. How about you just all those and start over? Um, patient risk to refuse, of course, informed consent, fill out the run sheet, document, 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 um, and then meeting all the criteria. Uh, when to worry, no one to stay with the patient, of course, you've been to the multiple visits for the same thing, you know, I'm sorry, you know, this is not the third time today, time for you to go to the hospital. Um, any if they've had any medication changes on oral meds, um, and if they're on the long acting insulin, which I'm plus or minus with that. That's a bad day. Right? <laughs> Questions? 
Pardon. Pardon. I'm teaching my son how to sign. Oh, oh really? Uh, yeah, this is it's all done. All right. So again, just a reminder for everyone that was on the web and all that stuff. Uh, just remember to go back and do the EMS education offering form um, through the Survey Monkey and all that stuff. Or if you want to fill out paperwork and have it scan it and email to me or from that stuff, go from there. I'll get the certificates out to everybody. Um, I still have to get you guys these other certificates from last time. So I have not forgotten about those. Any questions? I did not.